Yeah, we met Elton John once at a festival in Chicago, Chicago? San Francisco. Uh, yeah, sh- San Francisco, San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, he invited us over to like sit with him for a, an for audience. A like a guy comes in and says, would you like to meet? No, he didn't even say, would you like to? You, Elton would like to meet you. And then just like, oh, well, can't refuse that. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to say I'm with Joe and Al from Hot Chip. Hey guys. Hi there. How are you? Good, thank you. Yeah, we're good. Can I just say thank you, first of all, for inviting me to your studio? This is where the magic happens, isn't it? It sometimes happens, sometimes it doesn't quite happen. Sometimes the illusion uh, fails. <laughs> yeah, but most of the time it works out pretty good. So your seventh studio album has just been released. Mm-hmm. Quite an evocative title. Yeah. A bath full of ecstasy. You've probably got so many people asking you where the title came from. It's fun, just when you said it again, then it made me smile again, so that was... <laughs> That's a good sign, hopefully. Yeah. Do you find you smile a bit less each time? Yeah, a little bit less. Yeah, so it's, it's starting to become just straight. And then after the straight, it becomes a grimace. Yeah, it's a kind of a, like, quite, like, long kind of twisted story. At the root of it, like, we just we just wrote a song called Bath Full of Ecstasy and, and thought that that was a, a fun and kind of, yeah, out of the ordinary kind of title. So that's the, like, the simple part. But then, like, within the band, there's very different attitudes to ecstasy as a drug yeah that type of ecstasy when we originally wrote the song i don't think we were really referring to the drug so much but obviously that's the connotation if you're like if you make house music we felt like it worked for the music on the record because there are quite a lot of moments where try to kind of create like a kind of ecstatic feeling you know particularly in the first song melody of love is it samples like a gospel record you know and that kind of religious ecstasy really related to something that we were trying to create you know so he was somebody that was much more into that title when it was started flying around so it feels quite validating that you know we went with that and that is much more his vibe if you were to like think about Philippe in the context of those words that it seems to seems to fit it's really hard to to talk about in some ways because it's like it's not you know it wasn't done in that way or with that kind of like you know sort of background or or that extreme kind of like sense of loss and tragedy is kind of not what the record is about but suddenly when you sort of see it through that frame you start seeing it in in different ways and it brings out different qualities of the music i mean for us yeah it was just a kind of um yeah it was a tremendous like pleasure to get the chance to do even this small amount of work with philippe and to have known him for that amount of time um, we're just really grateful for it, so, yeah. Is it quite difficult to listen back to the tracks on the album now? Because obviously you've got that memory of working with him and uh, him as a friend. Yeah, you do find, like, with the loss of, of, of a person, um, you, you have those triggers of kind of memories and things, and so we're playing songs that we worked on with him at festivals at the moment, and it is quite poignant, and we get emotional, and, and you find that these, like, memories and this sadness kind of comes at at moments when you're not expecting sometimes so it's kind of it's a bittersweet thing as you as you alluded to but quite proud of the music that we made with him at the same time you know and the cassius album came out the same week the well. same day yeah. same day yeah. yeah of course yeah 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 i mean and yeah i mean that was the whole thing that um yeah just the i mean there is never a good time to die young but like the, the, the kind of the particular framing of that just was almost too much like I was just completely insane so um so yeah you know but I mean that to have those two records as a as a you know as a sort of like a document of where he was at that time and um I think that that's that's a tremendous kind of solace for the people that that knew him I guess I'm fascinated by the fact that there are Katy Perry connections with Mm -hmm. this new album as well because one of the tracks she used on her album Alexis and I got together like two and a half years ago maybe and we were asked to present some demos to her so we came in here and wrote a bunch of ideas and one of those ideas was the music for the track called Spell on this album and we went into Air Studios with her for four or five days and worked on that song and another song and the other song <clears throat> became a track on her most recent album. I think it's called like Into Me You See. And we wrote that with her in the studio, which is a really crazy experience, but good, 
quite kind of exhilarating and weird for us because we don't really do that kind of thing that often. But the and the other song didn't get onto her album, but we thought it was it was really good. So we kind of rewrote it and produced it. It was it was really just a demo in terms of the way it sounded. So that was the first thing that we worked with Philippe on. Yeah, I always get the impression that she's such a great person to work with. There doesn't seem to be any rules, although she's very professional. She seems to look outside the box. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It was a it was a pretty crazy experience. It, she was really, really, really funny and really hardworking, really smart, like really engaged with the whole thing. Seemed to be super excited to do it which I wasn't expecting at all. Like you hear stories of mega stars in the studio sometimes being really like kind of just on their phone or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, and just Definitely. waiting to be kind of impressed. She wasn't like that at all. She was like, she's a pro. She's a pro and like, you know, wrote all the, all the <coughs> melodies and words that she was singing herself with, with a friend that was with her. They put in a lot of work and would just made us feel really welcome. And she was really, really like hilarious as well. You so. said she was really good at ad, uh, ad libs, or what do you call those things when you just right, like, yeah. kind of like do the, you know, when you have to like do all the improvisations at the end and they do all the kind of vocal acrobatics and stuff. Yeah. She said, do you want me to do some of those? And, she, and the Joe and Alexa were like, yeah. And she like, it just did a bunch of really wicked ones. <laughs> yeah, she, her vocals, she nailed her yeah. vocals like super quickly. and Yeah, mm. which must be fun to see. But the cra actually the crazy thing about it was like, I thought, we would just go in there and like present her with these like stems for these demos and then she would have like a kind of engineer producer person that would then like take over and kind of like produce the thing but it wasn't like that at all i just went with my laptop and i was supposed to be that person so i was like super nervous the whole time that i was like screwing everything up and being really slow but but her feedback was great afterwards well she never gave feedback but she, <laughs> she, she kept coming back each day so yeah and like, you know, I had about five follow-up emails. It was like really could do with that feedback. <laughs> <laughs> feedback. That must be quite important to you as uh, as artists, producers, songwriters. That you you kind of want to know how the people that you work with are feeling because yeah, it's you want to get like a rating, thing. like a five star rating, like a, yeah, yeah, yeah like an Uber rating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah no, it's it is true. Like it's when you walk into a studio with someone you don't know, and you're just like, right, we're supposed to write a song now. You don't know emotionally what's going on with anyone or like what their normal process is or you know how they're feeling about about trying to create something with someone they don't know and like I yeah I find it pretty nerve-wracking honestly but you know I think it's one of those things like the more you do it the more you get used to it and the more you're able to just attack it and kind of get on with it I mean it's weird because basically we've we've just written songs as a group and myself and Alexis and, and everyone else for like 20 years or something so we're not you're not used to it really there is a rumor about the ready for the floor track which um the rumor was that you wrote it for kylie yeah i can't true. actually remember <laughs> what happened with that there was talk there was talk of um us trying to do a session with kylie but i think i think i think alexis just made up the thing about ready for the floor um like i don't think we were ever going to give that song to her um, it was too good to give to Kylie. That was the rumor. <laughs> yeah. I'd love, I'd love to do something with her. I think she's cool. No, it definitely would be awesome. It was a big hit here. It was number six, wasn't it, in the UK? Yeah. Was it six? Yeah. Seven, six. Okay. Oh, it's still our know. most streamed song. We would looked that up the other day. Yeah. A very heavily streamed. And our best yeah. chart position. Yeah. Yeah. What was your reaction to that when it was such a hit? And did it change you as a band? That success? Because you have always had that success, especially like the kind of loyal fans that you have, you've got a very, very loyal fan fan base. I remember just being really excited about it. I was really excited that it appeared on a Now That's What I Call Music compilation. <laughs> you know you've made it. Yeah, it that was so it. good. Because <laughs> like, you know, as a like nine, 10 year old, I remember being like having a couple of those tapes that were really important to me. And I, you know, had like some really good Paula Abdul single that I really loved on it and I don't know we were excited about it I don't feel like it changed us that much um, and we didn't we didn't really get that much pressure from EMI through that period to kind of like do more of that they left us to our own devices quite a lot so we were low down the list <laughs> yeah we were not a priority I mean yeah it's like yeah it was definitely a big deal for us but like they were like okay you got it was top 10 for like a week like it's not so much of a big deal for them probably but you know but they you know it was also one of those things where it had a lot of staying power like that song and over and over it's like it wasn't just like a thing that had an impact and went away like it became part of this like canon and it was just like there for 
I mean, and it kind of still is. Like, it's definitely yeah. like one of those kind of kind like, of indie disco. Yeah, indie yeah. disco student hit things. Like, and when I, again, like, still when we play it live, and we change, we particularly change that song up quite a lot when we play it live, and um, and so there's like quite a long period before people realise what the song is, and they're like, oh yeah, it's that one. Like, you know, <laughs> People always mention those songs as well. I was at a party last night. People people mention those, those tracks. Mm. Yeah, no, that's what makes us really proud because it's like you know it, it means that it's actually kind of like seeped into the culture, which yeah. is. Um, and we're big fans of bands that have had that kind of like left field underground pop hit, you know, like Sparks or some a band like that. You know, we we love that kind of level of hit from the past, the kind of geeky hits, you know. So, kind of suits us. Your debut album came out in two thousand and four, I think. How have you changed as a band and as people since that time, since the very beginning? Has it gone the way you wanted, you always wanted? Um, it's been pretty good. We've uh, never had any kind of like real crises. Crises, crises of conscience. <laughs> um, yeah, I was actually th talking about this the other day on another interview because somebody was asking about how like the, the funny, that debut record has got some like very like straight up funny lyrics and then they were saying but your Maury stuff is more ironic and I was like I hadn't really thought about that but that's kind of true I think there's still a lot of humor in the um in the lyrics but it's kind of become a little bit more kind of uh there's a there's a, t a touch of just like bitterness basically and I think that that is just that thing of going from your sort of like mid late 20s to your mid late 30s kind of thing there's like a little bit of uh, optimism that's beaten out of you I think um, also when you're making your first record, you just have this crazy naivety and innocence. Oh, sure, yeah. You know, you're just like making the first record. We were just in my bedroom in Fulham in my dad, my, my mum and dad's house. Just like not, <laughs> I didn't have any idea of like what it feels like to just be like really cussed in public and like magazines and stuff for being a bit stupid and silly. So you're just like full of all this like in jokes and kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely more sort of, freeing and you're not you're not thinking about legacy so much no <laughs> Stuff like that. so uh yeah but i mean i don't know about anything else really i mean it's just it was one of those our sort of career arc is when i look back at it is kind of funny because it was never like a point where we like suddenly got rid so every every kind of like stage seemed we were kind of like ready for it like every, and that meant that the, the the sort of feedback loop of it has been sort of very nurturing and gentle like and we we've, we've actually managed to like really learn our craft quite well never had to like suddenly absorb like a new reality or whatever so um i think that stood us in good stead you are a band that plays a lot of festivals mm -hmm. and i, I just want to know how it feels as a band but also as people that go to festivals have you, have you been to festivals when you're not performing oh, for a while right <laughs> yeah um because they can be quite hard work i mean as oh, fun as man. they are yeah they're tough aren't they you've got to kind of you need a strategy yeah yeah definitely <laughs> um we, we love, always we all love glastonbury and so that's been a big one for us over the years and that would i think we would definitely go there even if we weren't playing but we nearly always play kind yeah. of thing it, in one form or another but um yeah, I mean, that's the other thing about, like, for instance, what we were talking about, like, changing up some of the songs. It's like, if you have been to a festival over the last 10 years, you've probably seen Hot Chips. So it's kind of important for us to keep it fresh for the audience as well as for ourselves when we're coming to the live arena. So it's all, always interesting to kind of, like, mix it up with your own shows as well. Like, you know, we, we are very conscious that you can't, there's things that you can get away with for your own shows. You can't necessarily get away with festivals and that was a bit of a learning process. Like sometimes I felt as though early days we might have asked a little bit much of our audience that didn't couldn't possibly have known some of these songs and, and stuff like that. So yeah, we we've, we've learned how to be a, a decent festival band after like yeah, lots of experience of it. And the DJing obviously is a, an important side project as well, sure. along with many other side projects that you have um, outside of Hot Chip. Would you still want to carry on doing that? Because of course you've got the remix work as well and the the mix shows and the radio shows yeah is that something you want to continue doing i think it, it differs for different members of the band like felix is very very invested in world of kind of djing he spends a lot of time on his radio show and dj mixes and finding doing his own edits of tracks and all of this stuff dj culture is kind of a big passion of his like less so for for owen and alexis maybe a little bit but yeah i i love it i find it really really um exciting and i'm still 
in love with doing it. And it informs what we do with Hot Chip Live really nicely as well. You know, we try to construct the Hot Chip Live show so that it flows like a DJ set does. And and I also feel like keeping abreast of kind of dance music and disco reissues and new music that's, that's coming out um, in order to kind of do a good job as a DJ gives us lots of ideas when we're coming to write for Hot Chip and so it's really it's really important yeah basically for for most of us I think. Do you reach out to the artist specifically or does it work both ways do you get approached because you've remixed some fantastic you know really distinctive artists like Tracy Thorne in years and years. It does work both ways yeah I asked Robin if I could remix her song Honey because I was a big fan of it and that's coming out quite soon and, and I just really wanted to do that I mean yeah like mostly the ba- the band's management or label contact us um, but yeah it can work both ways sometimes you just hear a song you so badly want to kind of like mess around with and is it always a conscious effort to do something completely different to the original or something that's faithful to the original how, how does it work when you really I mean that can that really varies, you know, sometimes it just, I think it's like recontextualizing the track so that you feel like it would work in a, in a slightly different context. Sometimes you hear a track and the vocal is fantastic, but the, the beat or whatever wouldn't fit in with a, a house set, for instance. And that's quite a simple, a simple, um, Problem to fix. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we did that with the, uh, oh, I, I didn't work on it, but these guys worked on the Lizzo remix recently and like, it is it's like it's very sort of respectful but like it's but it kind of supercharges that song and means that like you know people recognize it straight away and then you know it just it, you can just keep the energy of whatever the set you're doing you know kind of just like and that is it's something that feels quite simple but we've realized that it's actually it can be quite hard to to nail that you know to make it not feel as though someone's just just kind of stuck a beat underneath it but they haven't like messed with the kind of like you know what works about the song yeah so, it's, a, it's a subtle thing because you it feels egotistical to take a good track and just kind of really screw around with it just because you're remixing it and you feel like you're supposed to or like you, i don't know sometimes doing something subtle is the best thing to do other times you do kind of have to tear apart the track and kind of re put it together because the track sounds bad <laughs> <laughs> do you want to name it <laughs> no <laughs> Like I remember when Franz Ferdinand got remixed by Daft Punk and they basically didn't really change much. Um, They kind of added a kick and maybe like changed the arrangement a little bit. And they obviously did that because they were like, this track already works. We're just going to push it slightly towards being more like a club thing. And that's like, that's actually the kind of more intelligent thing to do. You know, not, not feel like you have to really mess with it. You know, just do what needs doing. One of the biggest club successes on the LGBT scene is Horsemeat Disco mm-hmm. and you, you, you play a big part in that and yeah, of course we you're in Berlin. Out with those guys the other yeah. week yeah yeah you, you get really well don't you as, as friends oh, yeah. as well yeah. yeah for sure yeah I think they're just fantastic yeah I think we, we played a live at Horsemeat years and years ago uh, which I don't really at, remember at the, at that the much cock. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah but speaking to Jim and yeah, yeah we I just really have a lot of respect for them you know for their um, knowledge of different aspects of club music and all their different for the facets of it you know Severino's more housey kind of Luke's just been there like for so long and been such an important part of so many different amazing clubs and Jim slightly like brings like newer records I think and, and James older disco his knowledge of that is just amazing so between them just this wealth of understanding of dance music is just just really great yeah it's really genuine as well isn't of it? course it feels, yeah yeah, yeah full of genuine. like love for it so you feel as though they've been doing it whatever the case and it's that's that's been their strength really like it's just sort of um everybody is you know built up that respect for them they were like djs djs and then now you know they've had such a good sort of like 18 months two years and then like people are actually getting to know what the fuss was about and then yeah. we're really really pleased for them i saw a great instagram post i think it was your son doing the floss yeah <laughs> it's like inspired yeah. you've obviously taught him well <laughs> <laughs> i i can't do it so i don't know what like it's, easy to him, it's this thing of like um in the in the playground at their school like none of them are allowed to play this game Fortnite, but they all do the dances from Fortnite together in the playground so i think like dancing learning dances is just like really mm-hmm. just kind of so natural for them all 
It's really cool. I can, I can learn a few things from those moves. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't do it. No, <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> now, you have a genuine love for house music, like the roots of house music, because your music feels very inclusive. With Hot, Hot Chip, you touched on the humour that you've got. To me, it just feels it feels inclusive, and I think that's why the LGBT community get you as a band, because it, it feels like it's... Well, approachable. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but also, if you if you do love... If you do have a passion for like disco and house music then you, you, that means that you're going to be inclusive doesn't it because all the roots of all of that music are so wrapped up in lgbt Absolutely. stuff you know and i was i'm like a dis, studied history at university so i've read lots of the kind of peter shapiro and these like quite serious books about the roots of disco and it, and you know it's really important um to kind of act, accept that and understand that dance music is it totally comes from that scene so and i mean you know it's particularly sort of in the current i mean the last sort of six months have just gone to show that there's so many battles still to to be fought and to to win on that front like even in the uk even in london even in the places that you think are sort of where all that shit's like over and done with it's just it's still totally there and it's getting unfortunately seems to be getting stronger so you know, from our point of view and from our side, all we can do is try and support that and try and support the, yeah, the sort of movements in LGBT to to kind of, yeah, just not be so, sort of underground and, and sort of apologetic and just be, um, yeah, just be completely, not even talk about being accepted, just not even discuss. Like, and that's what we'd like it to be. And, um, and so, yeah. Trying to, trying to do that as much as possible. You did a fantastic cover of Bruce Springsteen's Dancing in the Dark. And of course, we've got the movie out, which is out now, uh, Blinded by the Light. Is there a cover that you've wanted to do that you still haven't recorded that you've been itching to do? Yeah. Loads, yeah. There's we're a, kind of just talking wall, about right, it right, right now. <laughs> this, that's, this is, that was our list of like potential covers for this tour. Like Glad to Know You by Chaz Jankor, Small Town Boy. Oh, great choice. <laughs> um, which, we, which I really, really want to do, yeah. but... Um, yeah, and then um, Dancing in Lesbian Bar by Jonathan Richmond, which we do a little bit of at the moment, just a little excerpt, which is one of our, our favourite tracks by Jonathan Richmond. It's such a banger. Bizarre Love Triangle and Little Red Corvette. Um, big ones. Basically big, we were thinking about <laughs> fest festival type covers. Yeah, stuff that's going to go over in that situation. But uh, yeah, we've, we've just got a little bit more limited time than we were, were hoped for this year. We, I mean, we're doing this cover of Sabotage at the moment, which is... You know, we didn't know how that was going to go down, but it just people seem to be super stoked about that. And um, yeah, Alexis is like really just nails that. And we were as surprised as anybody else. Like he just nails that that vocal, and just um, it's really still exciting to play. Um, so we'll see. Yeah, yeah. That's very exciting. I, I was going to say, actually, you're allowed to mention it, and you just went ahead and did it. Yeah, so. yeah I mean, that, they're not necessarily going to happen. I mean, they no. just... <laughs> this was just us like thinking about our set for this year. Yeah. So, yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. yeah. And I mentioned the Springsteen movie, although it's not a rock biopic, there are a few out. There seems It seems to be a time of rock biopics. Have mm -hmm. you seen any of the, the Bohemian Rhapsody or yeah, the I saw, Elton John? I haven't seen. Rocket Man one, but I saw the Queen one. Yeah, oh, yeah. Rocket Man's fantastic. Yeah, I quite yeah, want to see that. I think. Yeah, we met Elton John once at a festival in Chicago, Chicago, San Francisco. Uh, yeah, sh San Francisco, San Francisco. Yeah, yeah, he invited us over to like sit with him for a, an for audience. A like a guy was, comes in and says, "Would you like to meet?" No, he didn't even say, "Would you like to?" You, Elton would like to meet you, and then just like, "Oh well, can't refuse that." Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if there was to be a hot chip biopic. Could you imagine anyone playing your roles? Playing your oh my god! <laughs> 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 who who does um, Owen always say about? It's like that kind of the, the Welsh guy that's um, uh, Oliver Reed. No, no, no that, that would be me. That's the sort of uh, the blonde. I don't know. I can't remember. We have sometimes had this discussion, but I can't. I can't think who it would be offhand. <laughs> it's very hard. You can only talk about what other people would be. Yeah, I don't know. We, sh we should come back. We should. That's a kind of that's a kind of question where we should have the answers in our back pocket, and we don't. Well, we will get on that. That's more of like a homework question. Now you've played lots of festival dates, but you are about to play Ali Pali, mm -hmm. Alexandra Palace in London, which Joe, is the dates. one of the best venues. Yeah, it's the twenty sixth of October. Yeah. <laughs> Boom! That's I had that Boom. in my back pocket. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited about that. Yeah, 
it's going to be great we've got like good guests kind of um going to play with us hopefully are you allowed to say who they are have you said who they are already? no no, no. i don't think it's totally confirmed but it's exciting if it happens and we yeah we've got like a full sort of like festival light show which normally doesn't sort of make it to an indoors setting so it'll be a lot of firepower in there and um yeah it's a great venue as well, isn't it? It's yeah. ten thousand, I think. Isn't it? Yeah, I yeah, I went to watch. Who's counting playing. after a while? You know, <laughs> yeah. it's too many. Um, I went there most recently to see LCD Sound System uh, when I was playing a, like a couple of years ago, a year and a half. Yeah, like a couple of years. And it was, yeah, the atmosphere was amazing in there. Yeah. So. How important is it to have? a massive crowd because of course those days are gone where you play a, maybe a smaller crowd no those uh, they still happen yeah, yeah <laughs> we did some we did some shows some really tiny shows at the start of the year when we were sort of still warming ourselves up because we'd had quite a break with our, like it was like three years off so we were felt as though we would need to kind of ease ourselves in a little bit and so we were doing some i mean like a couple of 100 250 probably was the smallest one we did on that run so it was really cool to get back to doing that intimate um very int- i mean we like we couldn't fit on most of the stages so it's like every day was like trying to just play this game of inches and trying to get your stuff on but but yeah no it's really it was really good to do that um and to remember what that's i mean it's not even for any of us not to remember what it's like because we've also all got these other projects which were always like you know start having to start out and so you do that again and and so it's you know not too much of a thing Thank you very much for your time, guys. It's great no to meet problem. you. I wish you continued success with the with the album, which is still relatively new, isn't it? Isn't it? Oh yeah, a few weeks. Mm-hmm. Still, 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 uh, it's got some got some life to it. Mm-hmm.